Right, well, well, good morning. Um, as I say, the title is Herbicide Resistant Weeds, Lost Battles and War Winning Tactics. Uh, but I think we'd have to uh, admit that um, we've lost the battle of preventing herbicide resistant weeds. Um, but there's much we can do to combat the threat. So let's be positive, and I'm noted for being a very positive guy. Um, I hear a few chuckles there. Um, so let's not assume that we will lose the war. But clearly, blackgrass is the major resistance issue. Uh, we shouldn't forget about ryegrass and wild oats. Indeed, we found a new mechanism in uh, resistance in ryegrass, which will be announced in the new year in the farming press. Wild oats we need to be aware of because you're very dependent on the ALS herbicides, you know, the Atlantis-type materials and the FOPs and DIMs. And if you get broad-spectrum resistance to those, which we don't tend to have at the moment, but we're testing samples at the moment, um, you're left really with only Avidex. So I think wild oat resistance needs to be looked at even though it's nothing like as big an issue as blackgrass. The broadleaf weeds, well, these are mainly resistant to sulfide ureas and are a, a, a threat, but while we've got alternative herbicides, um, you know, the solutions are not too difficult, and I'll, I'll say a bit more uh, about that. So clearly, you know, we've got this uh, resistance issue, and um, if we talk about just about blackgrass, we now estimate that over 16,000 farms in 34 counties have got resistance of one type or another, uh, and it's accepted now that some degree of resistance occurs on virtually all farms on which blackgrass herbicides have been used regularly for the last 25 years. And none of the companies uh, argue about that now. They probably would have done 10 or 15 years ago, but that's accepted. And so clearly, you know, resistance has been detected in blackgrass in uh, virtually all the counties. Um, there's a few counties missing. I would very much like to fill these in before I retire. Um, it's sort of my... <laughs> My equivalent of you know, climbing the Munros. I'd like to go out having covered every county in, in England. Um, Derbyshire is interesting. We haven't filled that one in. Interesting. I've been asked to give a talk on blackgrass in Derbyshire in the new year. Uh, and there is interest, and I've, I've talked in South Wales on blackgrass because blackgrass is just coming in there. So I think it's actually quite good that some of these farms where they haven't got major problems at the moment are interested in finding out how they can prevent blackgrass and particularly resistant blackgrass coming in. In fact, in South Wales, they think it's coming in in straw from England. Uh, they may well be right. Uh, so I think that is, is quite interesting. Uh, clearly, um, we have increasing resistance to Atlantis, um, and that's happening very widely, and I'm not going to you know, show any, any data on that because I think that's generally accepted. So with the post-M herbicides, and obviously FOPs and DIMs as well, we have resistance to... But how about the pre-EMs? Are the pre-EMs and stacking pre-EMs a solution? Well, we have resistance to all these pre-EM herbicides, despite what some companies would say. Uh, and I do feel you know, some sort of pride in, in, in some of the um, proof that there is resistance to these. It's solely down to work that we've done at Rothamsted, uh, and some of the things that some of the companies have said have been completely untrue, and I think they've known it. Uh, and it, it, I think this is slightly disgraceful in some cases where companies have claimed there's no resistance and when I think they've known there has been. So, as a political point, you need independent research to prove this. But, and it's a very big but, resistance is partial and appears to increase slowly. So that is a very big but. It's not to say you don't use these pre-em and they are very valuable, uh, but resistance can occur to them and it can build up but generally slowly. So clearly uh, we have an, an issue with resistance. Now the, the three projects I'm going to cover, I've been asked to cover, are basically uh, sustainable winter cropping rotations under threat from herbicide resistant blackgrass. That's largely linked to delayed autumn drilling. The second one is looking at crop cultivars and the competitiveness of those. And the third one is on broadleaf weeds, particularly ALS-resistant poppy. And I'll, I'll show these titles as I go through, so I won't, won't dwell on those. So to start with, the uh, project which we're doing at Rothamsted in uh, collaboration with NIAB TAG, and it's HGCA-funded. Uh, um, this is uh, looking, as I say, largely at delayed autumn drilling and seed rates. And so the design of these trials, and we've done the three trials uh, at Rothamsted as part of our commitment, and the, there's one trial still going on at NIAB TAG, 
Um, the design is the same on all of them, so we have a split plot design, untreated uh, split plots and uh, other ones with the herbicide program. The herbicide program, glyphosate pre-drilling, and then we have Liberated D5 pre-M, followed by Auxiliary and Crystal. No Atlantis, because we're really looking forward to the days when Atlantis isn't worth using on some farms. Uh, and can you sort of compensate by delayed drilling? So we have three target drilling dates, mid-September, early October, late October, and three seed rates. I won't say much about seed rates, because these do have a, a fairly marginal effect. The main issue is if you have a very low seed rate, that encourages black grass but there's not too much difference if you go from a medium to a high seed rate. So I won't say much about that uh, in this talk. So what are the results from the three trials that we've done at Rothamsted? And I'll say, you know, the NIAB tag ones uh, show the same sort of effects, but they haven't completed their series. This is on untreated plots. So what we've got, uh, and the, the colours of the three years uh, of trials, uh, and, and here's the early drilling date, next drilling date, later drilling date. And so we've got a big positive effect in this year and this year with the numbers of black grass plants there with delayed drilling. But, oh dear, what's happened here? Uh, we've got a negative effect. We've actually got more black grass with delayed drilling in this year, the 2011-12. And this was largely because of the dry conditions at this first drilling date. And interestingly, even when... Uh, the rains came and it got wetter, there was not compensation. You didn't suddenly get a later germination. So this does highlight the inconsistency of some of these non-chemical methods, and I'm afraid that does come down to the weather. You know, there's no way around that. There is a certain level of inconsistency, but on average there was about a 38% reduction um, by delaying drilling um, from mid-September to early October, um, but clearly there were big differences between years. But more relevant, really, is on the treated plots, which had the herbicide program. Here, we've got a very nice, consistent effect in all years, and indeed on the NIAB tag trials, for less black grass with delayed drilling on the treated plots. I've changed the uh, axis here on the previous one. It was up to 700. Here it's 140, because clearly all the herbicide programs are reducing the black grass populations. But you have got this reduction even on, in this year when, in the absence of herbicides, you had more black grass at the second drilling date. And this is clearly due to better efficacy from the herbicide. If you actually compare sort of that figure with that figure there, it's about a 68% reduction, which is the average. I mean, I've, it won't be 68% there, but averaged over these three trials, you've got a 68% reduction um, the same herbicide has been used, but the, you've got 68% reduction in the black grass population by delaying drilling to the 7th of October. Look at it another way. If you'd used your herbicide, and again, all of these had had the herbicide, and you had this population, and you wanted to get down to that, you'd need to use another herbicide giving 68% control. But actually, you're getting that reduction for free, because the cost here is exactly the same as there on the herbicide, you're getting that reduction for free with the proviso that A, you get your crop drilled in mid-October and the yield is the same as from the early drilling. That's the small print. Um, but it is quite useful. And can you get 68% control from additional herbicide? So you've got, we've got quite a nice uh, trend there, which again is consistent over all the trials we've done. So if you just focus on the herbicide efficacy specifically... Um, well, here, you, you, we've, we've, we've meaned the three Rothamsted experiments uh, and percentage control of plants on average has gone up from 79 to 87 to 8, 8, 89 uh, with the three drilling dates and, and in terms of control of heads, 50, 72 to 84. So, and this is purely efficacy. This takes out the black grass density. This is purely looking at herbicide efficacy of the programme. Uh, and I say this is a very consistent trend with better control from uh, the later drilling. Uh, and on average, it's about 19% if you take the, the benefit over all the, the, three delay, the, the two delayed drillings relative to this. So that, that's you know, really very useful uh, a finding, which, as I say, is consistent on the um, 
uh, other trials that NARB TAG are doing, and also we're doing a review of 375 trials data which we have been provided with by Bayer, BSF, DuPont and Syngenta. It's very good they've given us access to their trials data on crystal and liberated pre-emergence, and that's being analysed still at Rothamsted, but we get the same on average effect that with delayed drilling, crystal and liberate are working better with delayed drillings, and most of that benefit is coming from delayed drilling to the first half of October. Uh, and that is really quite a nice finding, and, and, and more will come out of that when we finish the analysis. It varies hugely. It's not to say you always get that. Of course, it does vary, but on average, it's that data from 375 trials, a million pounds worth or more, uh, uh, trials worth data, which would never normally be made in the public domain. I'm very much appreciative of those four companies providing that data with no strings, uh, and we will make more of that once the analysis is finished. So that's really quite a nice, nice finding. And so really, the conclusions from this first bit, um, delayed drilling will usually result in less black grass in the crop, as more crop can be, more, more can be de destroyed before drilling. In, it will generally result in better control for the herbicide program as conditions for residual herbicides will usually be better. And thirdly, black grass emerging in later drilled crops will normally be less competitive. I haven't showed any data on that, but that's generally true. Yes, usually, generally, normally, have to put in those caveats. This won't always happen, but the, the data is that, generally speaking, these, these do happen, but they will not happen in every field. And you just have to accept that because a lot of this is down to the weather in any one autumn, and of course that is unpredictable. But generally speaking, this, this happens. This, this middle one, I think, is interesting because I'm not claiming this is a completely novel um, observation. Some people said, well, we've known about that for many years. I have seen trials data from the past where people have done different drilling dates, looked at herbicide efficacy, and there has been no mention that the main conclusion to me that herbicides would work better at the later drilling dates is made in the reports. It talks about individual herbicides and how they've worked, but the, the take-home message to me has been this general um, you know, conclusion that with many of these herbicides, they are working better with later drilling, and that's completely left out of the report. So I would claim this is as not well understood as it should be, but I'm not going to uh, you know, sort of uh, claim it's completely novel. And some of you may well think, well, you've known this for years. And as I say, just come back to most of the benefit is delaying drilling to the first half of October. So, but what have people done? Okay, promoting delayed drilling. I've been doing this for 25 years and no one's listened, of course. Um, and this is testimony to that. In 1975, when I started working on black grass, 5% um, of the winter cereal, winter cereal crop was sown in September. It's now over 50%, a tenfold increase. And I would say, this is from Crop Monitor, very nice data, not very easy to get hold of this data, actually. It's not sort of published in a very readily accessible form, uh, but they, they're happy to provide it. I don't want to criticise Crop Monitor. Um, but basically, I would say this increase is unsustainable. Um, and I think people are, are just asking for trouble by this ever earlier drilling uh, where they've got herbicide-resistant black grass. Clearly, if your herbicides are working really well, there's no problem. But I think, you know, there's really got to be changes here. This is not a sustainable system. Okay. Right. The second project I need to talk about is competitive crop cultivars, and this is um, a project being done by Izzy Andrew, a PhD student at Rothamsted, um, part funded by Syngenta, BBSRC, and the University of Nottingham Agri have input, and of course HGCA are funding it. So this is only sort of part way through, um, but what she's doing is trying to understand how plant traits contribute to competition in cereals, um, to try to um, you know, make predictions about the competitive ability of new cultivars. That's critical. And the aim is to um, get a protocol um, which will allow for an index of competitive new wheat cultivars before they come on the market. Now, worldwide, uh, researchers have done work on looking at different cultivars of all manner of crops, wheat, barley, potatoes even, sorghum, you name it. 
Uh, and, and those sort of papers tend to just show the principle that some cultivars are more competitive than others. Complete waste of time. That principle's been established 30 years ago. I was working on Maris Huntsman and Virtue in the 70s. Waste of time establishing that principle. That principle has been established. What you actually need is, is actually you know, a protocol so you can actually judge new varieties even before they come on the market about their competitive ability. Um, what we tend to find is, and this is, isn't decrying you know, work done by distributors, which is very good work on, 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 on varieties, but of course with the turnover of varieties that we have, you know, when you really know which are the most competitive varieties, often they're about to drop off the list. So we do need to be more proactive, and clearly Syngenta are interested in this, uh, to try to get information at an early stage. This is a challenge, and, and ultimately we need to integrate cultivar choice with other culture control options, seed rate, sowing date, row width. And this may, Izzy may not be able to look at all of this, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how she goes. So she's doing work in containers, uh, and she's doing work in the field. So in containers, just to give an example of a, a, a result she's had, uh, this is actually, you may not be able to read this from the back, this is actually a black grass seed return for a range of cultivars. cultivars. These are two barley varieties, which of course are the most competitive down here. Then you've got a range here, you've got Maris Widgeon here, good old Maris Widgeon um, is obviously being competitive. Interestingly, Gerald, the oats here, which we tend to think as being competitive, was actually uh, one of the least competitive, which is rather strange. But I think the key point is not to make too much of any one experiment. Uh, and I do, do see some, some data in the farming press where uh, people have got data from perhaps from one trial which shows one variety in a particular positive light, and then that is hammered to death and promoted. Um, you know, one trial is not enough. You know, we do need to have more robust data to establish varieties rather than just finding one trial where something works really well and then, you know, trying to promote that generally. So we think we do need more work on this to establish. He's doing field work um, in, in trials and, and, and Agri are providing sites for that, which is very, very, very useful. Um, and she's looking at some of these traits. I won't go into these in, 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 in detail, but uh, you know, a range of different traits. Uh, this is a specific leaf area, a whole range of traits. But at the moment, no single trait is consistently related to suppression of black grass seed return and biomass across the three experiments she's done so far. So this isn't easy, but she's about halfway through, um, and so uh, the challenge is to come up with something that is more consistent. So this is work in progress. She did have a, um, an HGCA student bursary, which I think is a very good scheme, where you get a, a, a student for about 10 weeks in the summer, and Emily Strapp from Blath University was looking at allelopathy of cultivars, um, and the work she did did not show um, that there was a, there are any significant differences between cultivars in the allelopathic ability, and the conclusion was allelopathy in the lab did not drive suppression of weeds, suppression in the field in any obvious manner. And I think the, I have some concerns, allelopathy is a term that's being used very widely now, there's a lot of loose talk about allelopathy in all manner of um, forums, and I think allelopathy has to be proven in the field. Too much of the work in allelopathy has been done in the, the lab, and you can show things in the lab which do not show up in the field. And so I do, I think, I think one has to have some cautious. Allelopathy exists. I'm not saying one shouldn't do work on it, but I think allelopathy is being oversold at the, at the moment on the evidence available, grossly oversold in some circumstances. So real, you should ask real good questions about people who are doing, claiming allelopathic effects and try to look at the, their evidence, because often it'll be a bit thin in my experience. Okay, the third project is on um, the ALS resistant broadleaf weeds and it's largely looking at the rotational aspects. You know, bear in mind we have uh, you know, you know, BSF involved, Dow and DuPont and clearly uh, with Clearfield and possibly with DuPont in the future, you know, there are ALS inhibitors which you may be used in all seed rate. So there are issues in terms of the selection for ALS resistance which is what uh, poppies are largely resistant to. Uh, so this is a project that's only recently started and run by Lynn Tatnell at ADAS Foxworth. 
And we have found um, resistant poppy in 2001, and now over 25 farms in nine counties, very largely in the east of England. I'm sure there are more than this. We haven't updated this map, but certainly it tends to be an English weed. Chickweed tends to be more of a problem in Scotland. And mayweed, I think, needs watching because mayweed resistance is building up in Germany. We haven't many cases in the UK, but certainly that needs watching. And so the aims and the objectives are really to uh, develop practical solutions, prevent wide-scale increase in ALS-resistant broadleaf weeds, largely through, you know, throughout the rotation, identify the risks, development good strategies, and raise awareness of the whole issue. And just a few... Um, um, you know, methodologies. The field and container trials, which again, you know, like Izzy with her com uh, competitive varieties, a good combination of container work and true fields, it, it, those work well together. So they have two field sites um, and they're including susceptible and field population in the containers. There's a range of treatments, but the key thing is that some of these are ALS inhibitors like metsulfuron, as in Jubilee, some are, some are not ALS like MCPA and Crystal, uh, and then there is a sort of rotation which is being done in the field and also being simulated in the containers. I think the fallow may change, I'm not quite sure why the fallow was put in there, but uh, clearly there's continuous uh, wheat and then there's wheat, all seed rate wheat. And there's a range of pre and post emergence treatments which you'd expect to give higher or lower levels of selection for ALS resistance. So that's the, 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 the actual principle behind it. So just some uh, quick results. I'd say this is a relatively recent project. The Cambridge site, um, you may not be able to read this. This is Jubilee, this is the metsulfuron, and, and really the, the amount of black grass there is exactly the same as the untreated, so this ties in with the fact that this site has very high ALS resistance. In contrast, the, the crystal, whether it's followed by Jubilee or MCPA, has given much lower um, densities and in terms of heads, very low densities indeed. And this is largely from the pendomethylene in the crystal. Um, so there are colossal differences there. And when you look in the, the field, uh, this is an untreated control. It's a, it's a, it's a very good field experiment. It's a, it's a large field with a very uniform poppy population. Um, and where you've had the ALS herbicide, the metsulfuron, you've got really no control. The crystal followed by MCPA, you've got almost complete control. Um, and this is largely from the pendomethylene. This is a very organic soil, probably, they haven't had it tested yet, but it's probably at least 20% organic matter, which would normally reduce activity of pendomethylene. But pendomethylene has worked remarkably well here. And in the second year, this is the first year, you know, there's more of a matrix, so all seed rate and winter wheat will be grown on separate plots. So this was the establishment year, um, which worked really nicely, because you've got very nice, even, and different populations. So I think it has a lot to deliver, and it'll be a very interesting trial to follow on. So really, the summary from the threat from broadleaf weeds is that resistance is very largely specific to the ALS inhibitors, largely the software there is, there are other herbicides that tend to be fully effective, like pendomethylene with poppy, phroxipar, starane with chickweed, and ioxyl bromoxanil with mayweed. Uh, and while we have these, you know, there are simple solutions, but, of course, there may well be loss of some of these herbicides. They are under threat. That would greatly increase the problems, perhaps particularly with poppy, where there are fewer alternative herbicides. And we shouldn't ignore other weed species. It's interesting that these three have developed resistance to soft areas in many European countries. Why it's those three, no one knows. There are very few cases of resistance in Galium, worldwide, and Speedwells. You know, now, why is it that these three? We can't really explain that. It's just they're cropping up. Mayweed is increasing up a lot in Germany, and I think it needs to be watched in the UK. Um, it may not be as big a threat, but I think we do need to watch it. So, you know, just to um, sort of conclude, um, what really I want to um, highlight is some more sort of general points um, and that with resistance being so widespread, you need to know what you're dealing with. So we have this uh, leaflet, the benefits of herbicide resistance testing produced by the Weed Resistance Action Group and copies are available on the HGCA stand uh, out in the, you know, the, the main display area and you're welcome to take uh, copies of that. Um, we've also produced two um, leaflets, 
the, um, the, the leaflet on non-chemical, uh, potential non-chemical control of black grass. Uh, this was actually based on a review that Peter Luckman, myself and others did, published in Weed Research. You know, this is a heavyweight, eight and a half thousand um, you know, word document. Not many people want to read that. Um, so the, uh, the leaflet, the four-page leaflet, is a summary of this, much more readable. Again, 14,500 of these went out in CPM magazine. I mention that because Tom Allen Stevens is here. We're very grateful for him for dis distributing those. Uh, and we've also updated the blackgrass leaflet, which I, which I first produced um, back in 2010 uh, and updated this year. And, and we originally got through 28,000 of those. It's been updated. And again, there are copies out there. And I have electronic versions for anyone who wants them. Interestingly, I've had many more responses to my leaflets than I have to the formal publication, which we have to do at Rothamsted, High Impact Journal. So high impact, had hardly anyone respond to it. Uh, yet it's the most comprehensive review of herbicide resistant um, and control of uh, blackgrass with non-chemical methods that's ever been done. I don't think that's uh, unduly sort of amount of bullshit. Uh, interesting, no one's responded to that, but the leaflets responded, you know, I've had quite a lot of response from farmers, so that shows you a little bit about impact. So that makes my little political point. So there are plenty, plenty of, plenty of leaflets out there. And so just to, to really wrap it up, I think you've seen this sort of thing before about where you need to have integrated control, and here we've got four non-chemical methods, uh, and we've put in herbicides here, 90% control, from non-chemical methods, 90% from herbicides, so you get 99% control overall. The key point is there's no blueprint. So every farm is different, every farmer is different, an attitude to risk, safer uh, delayed drilling. So there's no one blueprint, and the key thing is to find out what works best at an individual farm level. That's absolutely critical. Um, the, the second point is that the cost of the, the control you get from non-chemical methods as opposed to herbicides, um, I think has changed. In the past, herbicides were really the cheap option. I'm not so sure now that on many farms the non-chemical methods are actually a cheaper means of control than herbicides. And it's perhaps an exercise to think about on farms um, uh, about that because I think the, the balance has very much changed. Uh, and the, the last point here is really that non-chemical methods should work as well in 20 years' time as they do now uh, resistance shouldn't happen to those. You can argue about spring emerging, black grass changing. Generally speaking, it's worth spending the time and effort to work out how best to incorporate non-chemical methods on individual farms uh, because that will pay long-term dividends. Um, most of the herbicides we have now, how well will they be working in 20 years' time? Propizomide might be, good old curb, if it's still around, but I would say most herbicides will not be working. So. Spending time with farmers, finding out how best to use the best non-chemical methods on their individual farm, which will vary from farm to farm, I think will pay big dividends. And I think that really is the, you know, the concluding point, and that clearly resistance is, is, is an important issue, and I think if you're going to combat um, resistant blackgrass, really you've got to think about delayed autumn drilling, spring cropping, Fallowing for two years, or grass lay breaks for two years, or rotational ploughing. Those are the four biggies. Those are the only things which make a big impact on herbicide-resistant blackgrass. If your herbicides work on blackgrass, there's no problem. If you've got herbicide-resistant blackgrass, those are the four biggies. They, farmers don't want to hear those, but they have just got to adopt those. There is no other solution unless we get a new herbicide, which is very unlikely. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Steve.